You are listening to audio from Citizens Church Elmira. You can find more resources and learn more about our church at citizensalmira.ca. If you have a Bible or on your phone, please turn to Psalm 30 if you're not there already. And again, if you're a, if you're a guest with us, welcome to Citizens on a nice muggy morning uh, in July. About a month ago, I was preaching at Wallenstein, which is air-conditioned, by the way. It was really nice. And um, I preached a sermon, and then uh, right after, a couple made a beeline for me. I could just see them walking right up. And I knew this couple. I had known them for many years already, actually. And they came right up to me, and they said... um, they said, man, thank you for praying for us last year. And I was like, oh, did I do that? And, and they reminded me that a year earlier, I had also spoken at Wallenstein, and they had made a beeline to the front again. But in that, that year, it was a totally different set of circumstances. I had, again, I had known this couple for decades, and they came up to me a year and a half ago, it would be now, or maybe two years ago, and uh, no, a year ago, and they said, um, man, this week has just been like a train wreck, all kinds of circumstances in their, their church life, in their family life, and then uh, the husband had just been fired from his job like days before, out of nowhere, so totally like the job he thought he was going to have for years and years to come was gone, and in that moment, um, I just, you know, it was one of those moments, I don't know if you've had these before, where the Holy Spirit is kind of like tapping you, saying, like, pray for these guys, right now, right here. And I don't always listen to that voice, but in that moment, obviously I did. And so I prayed for them, that was the end, I preached a sermon, moving on, and then a month ago, like I said, they came back and they said, man, when you prayed for for us, um our hearts were just like lifted up. We were just encouraged in the moment. Um, Within a week, uh, the husband got another job that was actually better than the one that he had just been fired from. And this was like a year on and it was just going so well. And, And they just wanted to tell me in that moment, thank you for praying for us on the spot there. And as I left that encounter with them, a couple of thoughts came to mind. The first one was, how can so much blessing come from one small moment of obedience? One that even, I'm not even aware of, of all that's going on behind the scenes. One little moment. And my other thought that was even a bigger thought than that first one was, Lord, how do we see more of that? You working you present in people's lives, where we are as your people, interacting and praying, and we're seeing your hand at work, your hand of power in people's lives, whatever that outcome is. This morning, we're looking at Psalm 30, and at first glance, Psalm 30 may not reveal itself to be this, but it is a psalm of testimony for David. David is giving us these 12 little verses, and he is reflecting on his life. And it's hard to tell from the context whether David is thinking of one specific thing that happened in his life, or if he is thinking of, you know, now as as an old man, he's reflecting on the totality of his life. But what David is doing for us in this psalm is saying, God's power has been evident in my life. God has been present And he has done something. And I want to tell you about it in this psalm so that you can also glorify God by all that he has done in my midst. And so it is a a psalm of thanksgiving. It is a psalm of testimony. Now, I know we are, you know, we're Canadian and we are um, Mennonite area here. So we're we're pretty calm and docile. But this is like, I was... um, at a conference in Georgia a number of months ago, and I was sat next to these people from Texas for a little while. I don't know if you've ever 
been with people who are Christians from Texas, but all the whole time as speakers are speaking, they're just like, amen, amen, hallelujah, testify. You know, they're just like constantly back and forth. So I'm not expecting that to happen here, okay? But listen, Psalm 30 is one of those psalms where if you're in Texas, people would be saying amen. They'd be saying testify because that's what David wants us to get here on display the power of God. But listen, it starts actually in a place of trouble, a place of discouragement. It starts for David actually in a place of pride. And so this psalm, and we've talked about this before. If you've, if you've been at Citizens throughout this whole, you know, this is our 30th Sunday going through a psalm now, you'll know that some psalms have a what's called chiastic structure. It's a chiasm, which is a way of kind of arranging itself, which to us who have the English translation, it's not very evident, but to the original Hebrew readers and to those who are writing them, they would structure it in a certain way, partially to help with memorization, because most of these psalms would be memorized either by the religious leaders or lay people, but also as a way to point us And sometimes, literally, it's like X marks the spot. So the chiasm is drawing you in with repetition to the center, and then it's bringing you back out to to kind of reflect on what the center is. And so the center, where the chiastic structure comes in and marks the spot, is in verses 6 and 7. Okay, that's really the starting point of this psalm. So read these, or listen to these verses as I read them. As for me... I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. So David says, here's the beginning of my testimony. This is where my story starts. It starts with a pride and an arrogance to life. That was the starting point of God working in my life. And we live in a day and age where the, like the, the use of the word pride is changed and there's like confusion um, on, on, both, on whatever side politically you're on. It's like it's a bit of a charged word nowadays. But listen, it's just a regular word that gets used in our language. And it has mostly two meanings. And they're both right in some senses, okay? And let me listen. Let me read you a definition. The first one is this. It's a reasonable or justifiable self-respect. Okay, to take pride in something. So an example from the dictionary is, the team was bursting with pride after recording a sensational victory. That sounds like a dictionary definition, right? So they they did something great. They won the tournament. There is self-pride for the effort that they did. That's a right definition of pride. Like, you may have done something great this week as well. You should feel good about that. That's called self-pride. But there is also a second definition of pride, which is also really important, and it's this. It's an improper and an excessive self-esteem known as conceit or arrogance. That's the other side of pride. That's the side of pride that pulls us away from God and his design for our lives. So Miriam just read for us, uh, from Genesis, and, and you can see from the, the early chapters of Genesis that uh, human pride comes onto the scene, a pride that is not like, hey, we just like tended this garden, this is great. No, it's actually a pride that says, we don't need God, we can take care of ourselves. And a few chapters in, you see the Tower of Babel, that story where the people are coming together And what they want to do is they want to make a name for themselves. So in chapter 11, verse 4, it says this. It's a great description of the effects of pride. It says, this is what the people were saying. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we are dispersed over the face of the earth. So there's a great view of what pride looks like when it is totally built on our own ideas, stepping away from God's design for us. It's making a name for ourselves. And as we've, we've talked about last week, um, is that God has actually made us 
for something. God has created us and he has given us purpose and meaning in this world. And part of that is that we would actually glorify him. So Isaiah 43 verse 7 puts it this way. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and have made. That's us. God has made us for his glory. He has formed us so that part of our purpose when we live life and when we do things is actually that we would glorify God in our actions and through our words and our deeds. And David here is reminding us, and he's saying part of his story is that pride actually says, when God comes to us and says, your purpose is to glorify me, pride says, no. I'm going my own way. I've got my own plans. I've got my own way to kind of run life and and what I think is right or wrong. God, you're not going to give me direction. I'm going to choose it for myself. And David says, this is my starting point. This is the beginning of my story. He says, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Have you ever said something like that? I've just got 100% confidence in this area of my life. David says, this is pride. And so each one of us is dealing with pride in some way in our lives. And the world that we're living in, uh, people who don't even know Christ, uh, when they live lives that are, you know, not butting up against the the truth of the gospel, their lives are pride-filled as well. And most of them, if they're your neighbors, these are Genuine people who want to live life, have jobs, just enjoy the things around them. They're living for themselves. That's the the only plan that they have. It is just totally revolving around their view of the world. But that view of pride can easily come into the life of a Christian as well. Those of us who have verses like Isaiah, who have Psalm 30, like the truth is revealed for us here can easily be diluted by our own pride as well. And David here is saying his own experience is that this this unchecked pride, this pride that was in his life, actually led to uh, what we'll call the discipline of the Lord. So in these verses it says that he experienced this like dismay and he experienced God hiding his face from him. These are actually some of the the ramifications that David experienced as a result of pride in his life. In in the New Testament, it comes to us in the form of this idea of God disciplining his children. Okay, And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it clearly talks about this. It says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Okay, so in Hebrews, he's saying, This is for believers. Here is the message. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So there is something actually in the life of the believer when pride kind of takes over. When pride is just unchecked and a believer says, eh, God's way for my life. I'm just going to go my own way. There's actually instances where the discipline of the Lord comes down. And, and it's not even, there's different descriptions of it in the New Testament, but it's not clear as in like, this is what the discipline looks like. But it does say that discipline comes. And it frames it, and this is helpful for us, it frames it actually in like a family context. Okay, so in Hebrews there, he's talking about my son or my daughter. And that's really helpful for us because children are actually like very pride-filled people, okay? So now, don't think of your neighbor's kids. Don't think of your own kids. Just reflect on yourself, okay, as, as a child, as far back as you can remember. I don't know what your, how far your memories go back. Some people can remember back to like four months old or so, you know, they're they're, they've got these deep memories. However far back you can go, think about your own decisions. Think about your perspective on the world. I know for myself, I thought as a young child that I knew a lot. 
like that. I, I don't know how my memory is not super great, but let's, if I can go back to like a teenager or maybe like 10 years old or something, I've just got a lot figured out in this world. And I wish, you know, my parents, I wish my teachers, everybody else would just get in line with what I understand the world to be. Children are extremely proud. And those children become adults like us. And the pride is still evident in there. And so the Lord actually has built into uh, our relationship with him this kind of discipline that comes even into the church life. You can see it in the New Testament as the New Testament believers are interacting. They're, they're helping each other because our own personal pride just constantly rises up. So the Lord disciplines us. But secondly, unchecked discipline in the life of a believer can make us cold to God or maybe a, a better. Don't begin to feel the, the, the spirit leading in our lives anymore. There is a coldness toward it. Augustine in his book, Confessions, which is his own, if you've never read Confessions, it's a great book to kind of read Augustine's description of his life and a, a life filled with pride by his own admission. He says this, to love our success more than God and our neighbor hardens the heart, making us less able to feel and to sense. This is the result, actually, of pride in our lives that goes unchecked. There, we become the center of everything. So our desire to follow the will of the Lord, our desire to love and sacrifice for our neighbor becomes secondary because we are primary and our desires and our hopes and everything we have for life becomes primary in it. And so love of God and love of self definitely goes, or love of neighbor goes secondary. And so David here begins the psalm by saying, that was my state. I was a man filled with pride. And re reading those verses, like that is a strong admission to confess that, to, to put that in writing for the nation of Israel to reflect on year after year, century after century, their king was a pride-filled king. Man, if only all, all of us, myself included, would have a heart like that. What could God do with a heart that is softened to our own sinfulness and inadequacy? And so he acknowledges that, and then David's response then at the, you know, the discipline of the Lord and the reality of this truth is to respond back to God in prayer. Verses 8 through 10. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. David here, rather than turning away from, you know, the difficulty of his, his relationship with God, rather than turning away from the pride that he's facing, he turns to God in prayer. And I just want to think for just a couple of minutes here about prayer together. This act of, of dependence on God, to, to speak to God to be honest with God in all things, we are called to it. If you were here during our Mark series or in our, you know, the Lord's Prayer series, we talked a lot about God calls us to be people who are a praying people, to be honest with him in all aspects of our lives through prayer. <clears throat> and in Luke chapter 18, it's another one of those moments where we are being called, we are being encouraged to pray. So this is a parable, the parable of the persistent widow. And Jesus tells it this way, chapter 18 of Luke, starting in verse 1. And he told them a prayer, a parable to, to the effect that they, that they ought to always to pray and not to lose heart. Okay, so verse 1, there's, there's the point of this story is that, that the disciples would be these persistent prayers. They would just keep going in terms of their prayer to the Lord. So verse 2, 
He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For, I, for, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by the continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So here's a, a fascinating uh, parable that Jesus is using to teach the disciples to be persistent in their prayer. You know, about this person who wants justice, and they're just like beating down the door. They just won't give up. They just keep going. They keep going. They want justice, and then eventually they get justice. A life of prayer through our own difficulties, through our own challenges. Here we are encouraged to pray, to be persistent in prayer. Tyler Staten writes it this way, God has a soft spot for the unglamorous secret work of prayer. Prayer is this like behind the scenes work that almost nobody knows is happening but that is going on or potentially is not going on at all. So let me ask you. David is saying, man, in the depth of my difficulty, I prayed to the Lord. The parable in Luke 18 is saying, man, be these people who are persistent in, in terms of your prayer life. So are you praying and contending for something? Is there something in your life where you're saying, Lord, I want to like see you active. You're like the, the person in that parable. You're just like banging on the door. You're asking God to do something in, in this area of your life. You are persistent in asking him. Are you contending for something? Contending means to like, it's like a struggle for something. You know, it's a work that is involved. You are doing this work to kind of fight for something. And the Lord's Prayer just reminds us also that whatever we are contending for, that God's will would always be done. If, if you were here during the Lord's Prayer series, uh, you'll remember that I think there was a slide of the, the Lord's Prayer that the, the beginning of the Lord's Prayer is like getting us to think clearly about what prayer is. That prayer is not just this magic list that we can give to God and out you know, comes exactly what we want. But the, the primary starting point in the Lord's Prayer is your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your name be hallowed. God is actually the starting point in our prayer lives. And so when we're contending for whatever it is, when we are kind of going to that, that work of prayer, it must be in the context of, okay, Lord, what, what is primary here is that your will is done. And God, if that is what I'm asking for, wonderful. If, if what I'm asking for is not in your will, then change me in the process. Do the work in me that needs to be done, if that's part of the contending. And so this life of prayer is, is meant to be a life that is saturated in knowing the will of God for us. Tim Keller puts it this way, to fail to pray then is not merely to break some religious rule. It is a failure to treat, to treat God as God. So when we don't pray, when we have a life that is prayerless, we're essentially saying, okay, God, you, you can't do what you do. You can't work in this situation. And David is saying, man, in, in my life, when pride stepped in, when I was kind of at my low point, the response was, prayer, which I, I think we would all readily admit is hard work. Like prayer is really hard work. But many things in life are really hard. Um, I was thinking this week, uh, 
in our house, Liz does most of the, the cooking, and we've been married now for 26 years. And so I was thinking, like, how many thousands of meals has Liz, like, cooked in our home, right? That's hard work. Thousands of meals over the years, okay? Hard work. Uh, I know some of you love, you know, different sports, and I was thinking this week of golf. I don't golf, so if you're a golfer, it's wonderful. Golf, according to Golf Magazine, takes like three hours and 40 minutes to do 18 holes. Is that right? Anybody? Yeah? You guys are doing Nobody wants to admit now, but yeah, three hours and 40 minutes, okay. Maybe it's not like super hard work, but that's kind of hard work too, right? Three hours of something. You're walking and you're hitting a ball and you're climbing in the woods to find it, like all that stuff, okay? And yes, I just compared prayer to golf, okay? But hard work is all around us. It's in our lives constantly. So to say that prayer is hard shouldn't be the excuse for any of us not to enter into it. It's just to acknowledge the reality of what it is. It is behind the scenes work asking for God to do something. Richard Foster, in his book on prayer, he writes this little prayer, which I just thought captured it so well. It says, Dear Jesus, how desperately I need to learn to pray. And yet when I am honest, I know that I often do not even want to pray. I am distracted. I am stubborn. I am self-centered. But in your mercy, Jesus, Bring my wanter in line with my needer so that I can come to want what I need. In your name and for your sake, I pray, amen. I think that kind of captures it up for most of us. We just, we want to pray more. We know that we need to pray more, but it is a hard work. And so it is a work that God is doing in each of our lives over all the years that he gives to us. And for for some of us who have been at it for decades, we're just like, oh, I just fall so short still, Lord. I fall, you know, so far short. And and God is just through a a psalm in someone's life where prayer becomes a part of it. It's a growing part of David's life. And again, we don't know where this is happening in his life, but he's saying this is part of the testimony. Discouragement through pride and response now to God in prayer. Which ends then with the final part, which is, so it starts with pride, it goes to prayer, and it ends now with this power of God working in his life. Verses 1 through 3, starting at the beginning, it says this, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. David is saying, God actually did something. I experienced power in my life. He restored me. He brought healing to my, to my soul. And if you'll remember, in the, in the Psalms, there are like six really large themes in the Psalms. And kind of the top three are, are meant to give us direction, orientation, and disorientation. So most of the psalms are praise psalms, which are these psalms of, you know, orientation. And, and they help us, like, just be praiseworthy to God. And then there's a large chunk of them, which are psalms of disorientation. These are psalms of lament where David or whatever author is like confused with what God is doing or super discouraged with what God is doing. And then the last category, the last big category is a psalm of reorientation or thanksgiving, where David or whoever the author is has come through this dark season. And now they're like back on the right path again of following God and knowing what God's will is for their lives. Psalm 30 is that psalm. It's a psalm of reorientation. David is saying, okay, I've experienced this thing now. I've experienced like the good side of following God and I've experienced the discouraging side of following God and now I'm at the Thanksgiving piece where I am experiencing what does it mean again to follow him, to see his power in my life. So he says, I cried out for help and you healed me. You restored me. These are like answers 
to prayer. Have you experienced answers to prayer in your life? Where you can look back actually your life and say, there's a moment right there where I was praying or someone else was praying in my life and God, you showed up. There was like power was evident in my life. Healing, restoration, encouragement, whatever it was. God showed up in that moment. And, and David is saying, this is a moment of, of testimony. This is testify. This is where the Texans would be like, amen, right? Hallelujah. That's, this is where they'd be queuing in. God has done something. He has powerfully acted in a way that reorientates David's life. And sometimes it comes in a moment, but other times it comes over like multiple years. I know this is, this is thinking back like four years already now. Uh, when our daughter was going to university, you know, it was kind of like a big thing as our first child moving out, going to university. And so, you know, Liz and I were praying and, and we really had one prayer request. This was like the main one. It was like, we just want her to meet one Christian friend. That's all we want. Just one friend that she can kind of lock in with, you know, for those years. And in the first few days, she met that friend. She met her best friend who ended up being a Christian and who would walk with her through those four years. But listen, it seems like the answer to the prayer is just like in one moment, you know, like boom, they bumped into each other on campus. But here's how it really works is this is like years of parents praying. Years of other people praying for your kids. And then there's the moment, there's, there's the bump in, but then there's multiple years then of that kind of being walked out and lived out. And so when we hear David saying here that God like restored, God did something, that usually means a span of like time where God is doing something. And the question is, are, are we going to be like aware and awake that, okay, God, I don't, it's not all put together yet, but God is active. He's doing something and I'm staying persistent here. I'm, I'm like the Luke 18 woman. I'm, I'm banging at the door. I'm still banging. God, show up. I need your power here. David is saying, don't quit in those moments. Because what the spiritual forces of darkness and what Satan would love to do is just lull us to sleep. Lull us as, as Christians to just ineffectiveness, just like a baby being rocked, just go to sleep, you know, just be busy with your life and do all these things, just be ineffective. Don't ask for big things. Don't ask for God to show up in powerful ways. Don't do that. That's a little too weird, a little too Pentecostal. We're not that, right? Just don't ask for God to do something. Listen to what J.C. Ryle wrote a hundred years ago. This was over a hundred years ago. J.C. Ryle wrote this. He says, there is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day, which many have and think that they have enough. A cheap Christianity, which offends no one and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is worth nothing. That's a hundred years ago. Ryle is saying, we got this problem, you know, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So this is a persistent problem where believers just regularly think, God's not going to show up in my life. God's power is not going to be evident in my life. So I'll just kind of like, I'll just be a simple, you know, just, I'll be a Christian still. I'm not going to throw it all out, but I'm not really going to ask God for something. Psalm 30 is a testimony saying, ask him. God is willing to work. He's willing to show himself powerful. The answer may not always be how we like it, but God is willing to show up. So this psalm, let's conclude here. This psalm is actually written, you can see uh, in your Bible, it might say that it is at the top, there's a superscription that says, it's a psalm of David, a song to be sung at the dedication of the temple. So this is something that David is writing for a future event, because the temple was not built in his lifetime. So he says, when the temple is finished, this is the song that can be on your lips when you're walking into that building. The building where people would come with their sacrifices, with their lamb or with their pigeon, 
And they would lay their hand on this animal and it would be killed and burned in their place. That's what the temple was for. And David is saying here, this is your moment to experience the power of God. Because at the temple, the power of God was actually displayed. And it wasn't on the, the killing of the animal. It wasn't on even all the things that was done. The miracle that happened at the temple was that sin was forgiven. Sin was covered. And hundreds of years later, Christ would come in flesh, God incarnate, and would come and would die in the place of sinners and would hang on a tree. And the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the sanctuary within the temple would be ripped apart. And people would experience the the very thing that David writes about here in verses 4 and 5, he says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry in the night, but joy comes in the morning. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, were weeping when, when Christ was hanging on the cross. But when Mary and Mary came to the tomb, to finish the embalming, to wrap more spices around it. In their confusion, they came to an empty tomb. And just like David says here, their joy came in the morning. And it was resurrection power, the power of God on display, which is still present in our lives. So church, let me encourage you today. May we be a people, a congregation who are persistent in their prayer and who are asking the Lord, God, we want to see more. I hope that in the coming years, the biggest story we have is not that we got to stay in this building for years and years on end. That's a wonderful answer to prayer. And it is part of our story. But man, we want more, don't we? We want to see God move in people's lives. We want to see hearts that are changed. The real miracles that can happen only inside by the Spirit of God. That's what I'm praying for. And I'm, I'm asking that God would just put us on fire to ask him to move with power. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this testimony of your power from the Old Testament. Thank you for David for revealing his, his heart to us and not holding back. And Father, I pray that we would be a, a people who are persistent in asking you to show your power. Lord, we pray that people's lives would be changed, that there would be healing in this church here, and that as we go out, Lord, that we would share the gospel, and that lives would be changed through the work of the Holy Spirit. And Father, would we be able to reflect on different years of anniversary of your faithfulness in people's lives and your power at work. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.